Thanks for joining me on my channel, Brutus on Baseball. This video is a continuation of a series all about prospects in baseball that didn't live up to the hype that we expected of them at the time. So my original idea was to do two of these busted prospects per episode, but I decided to give a little bit more and double it up to four per episode. That way I can get through it a little bit quicker because there were a lot of years that I did collect prospects from about 1988 all the way up till 2005. I'm continuing this video and where I left off the last one in 1990 with Kevin Moss. And today I'm gonna to pick up again with Ben McDonald in 1990. McDonald was the first overall pick by the Baltimore Orioles in the 1989 draft. He had been a two sport star while at LSU in both baseball and basketball, but he decided to give up the court because he thought his best chance for success would be on the mound. But it almost didn't happen that way because McDonald was represented by Scott Boris. And they were actually recruited by Donald Trump Associates in the spring of 1989 because Trump wanted to form his own baseball league. And he wanted McDonald to be the first marquee name stolen from Major League Baseball to play in his new league. But for whatever reason, McDonald would reportedly leave $2 million more on the table to sign with Baltimore instead of Donald Trump. Probably a pretty good idea. Now at six foot seven, McDonald was an imposing pitcher on the mound and 18 days after signing with Baltimore and only two minor league games under his belt, he made his major league debut for the Orioles in late 1989. Because of his late appearance, his hot cards were in the 1990 sets, most memorably the Donruss, the upper deck, and the score, at least for me. But despite pitching very well in 1990 and showing signs of being a really decent major league pitcher by accumulating a 115 ERA plus over parts of nine seasons, his career never really got going due to a variety of injuries. He finished his career with 78 wins and 70 losses, a 3.91 ERA and 21 war. After retiring at the age of only 29, McDonald spent several years calling college baseball games, as well as over a decade of calling Orioles games on the radio. Now the next one up after McDonald is one that I'm sure a lot of people remember, and that is 1991's Todd Van Poppel. Now Van Poppel was one of those really high risk, but really high reward young high school arms that the Oakland A's of the early 1990s were drawn to. Van Poppel was a candidate to go first overall in the 1990 draft. However, he followed the advice of his agent, Scott Boris, once again, and explicitly told the Atlanta Braves that he would refuse to sign with them. These concerns about signability dropped him all the way to number 14 in the draft, where the Oakland Athletics picked him up. The Braves, by the way, did pretty okay for themselves that year, drafting in the number one spot overall, a guy by the name of Chipper Jones. Now, Van Poppel signed a major league contract right out of high school with the Oakland Athletics, which limited his chances to really develop in the minor leagues because the Oakland A's were already paying him a major league salary, and they wanted to get him up to the team as quickly as possible. But with that in mind, his development took second place. That lack of experience really hurt his career, debuting with the big league A's team at the age of only 19, still a very raw pitcher. His 1991 cards were the hottest in the business at that time, and most memorable for me were the 91 score, upper deck, and even his studio cards. Despite spending 11 seasons in the major leagues, he was commonly ineffective or injured and never came near to reaching his full potential. His best years were as a relief pitcher with the Cubs in 2000 and 2001, but over the course of his career, he went 40 wins and 52 losses, with a 5.58 ERA and an 80 ERA plus and a negative 0.3 war. Van Poppel would finally retire in spring training of 2005, and he would go on to be a part owner of a pest control company in Denton, Texas. So Van Poppel's story is a great one because anybody who was collecting in that era remembers the craze around Van Poppel's cards and how everybody thought he would be the next sure bet in baseball. But for anybody that invested in his cards, they're probably sitting in a box somewhere deep in the basement collecting dust, never to be looked at again, because he just didn't pan out. And that happens with a lot of baseball players throughout the history of the game. The next one up is Phil Plantier. Now Plantier was never a very highly rated prospect, being drafted in the 11th round by the Red Sox and only ranking in the top 100 prospects one time at number 83 prior to the 1990 season. 
But what Plantier lacked in prospect status, he more than made up for by putting up huge numbers on his way through the ranks. He started by slashing 300, 405, 564 with 27 home runs in single A as a 20 year old in 1989. And as a result, the Red Sox skipped Plantier over double A and put him into triple A in the 1990 season. He started there again in 1991, where he began the season slashing 305, 438, 557, prompting a call up to the Red Sox big league team. He played in a total of 53 games for the Red Sox at the end of the 1991 season, where he posted an incredible rookie line of 331, 420, 615, with 11 home runs and a 178 OPS plus as a rookie. Based on that performance, his 1991 rookie cards took off and climbed all the hot lists that season. His most memorable rookie cards, for me at least, were his 1991 upper deck and score cards, but he also had the Fleer Ultra and Tops cards from 91 as well. His performance at the end of the 91 season as a 22-year-old rookie brought a lot of promise to Red Sox Nation. But unfortunately, the 92 season wouldn't be more the same. He slashed only 246, 332, 361 with seven home runs and only a 90 OPS plus in the 92 season. The Red Sox quickly traded him at the end of the 92 season to the San Diego Padres, where he would go on to put up the best season of his career in 1993 when he hit 34 home runs, but only a 240 batting average, but he still managed to accomplish a 122 OPS plus for that year. He didn't last long in San Diego either though, because the Padres were going through a sale and they began to retool prior to the 1995 season. They traded him to Houston in a deal that brought in Ken Caminiti and Steve Finley to the Padres. He spent the next few years bouncing around between the Padres again, the Tigers, the A's, the Cardinals, the Blue Jays, before retiring after a very short stint with the Mets AAA team at the beginning of the 1998 season. After taking a couple years off after retiring as a baseball player, he began his coaching career in 2008, where he was first hired by an independent league team, and then eventually by the Seattle Mariners to coach their AA squad. After bouncing around between the Mariners and the Padres minor league facilities, he eventually was named the hitting coach for the San Diego Padres prior to the 2011 season, where he would hold that position for the next three years. After being let go as the hitting coach for the Padres, he did coach for a couple more years in the minor leagues for the Yankees and Marlins, and then was named as the assistant hitting coach for the Los Angeles Angels in 2022, a position that he still holds. Plantier came on strong for the Red Sox in 1991, and everybody had high hopes, resulting in people gobbling up his rookie cards. But for anybody who held on to them, they were worth next to nothing after the 92 season. And that leads me to the biggest name of the 1992 baseball card collecting season, Brian Taylor of the New York Yankees. Drafted number one overall in 1991 by the Yankees, Taylor was often cited as one of the best pitching prospects in decades, and it was thought he would quickly become one of the best pitchers in all of baseball. He was also the first draft pick in history to get a contract worth more than a million dollars, signing for 1.55 million with the Yankees in 1991. He was quickly anointed the number one prospect in all of baseball prior to the 1992 season, and as a result, he became a card collecting sensation. His 1992 issued rookie cards were hugely popular with collectors. Since he wasn't actually yet in the Major League Baseball Players Association, he was welcome to sign an exclusive contract, which he did with Topps, so that only they could produce his cards. He had a card in the Topps base set and the brand new Stadium Club issued by Topps as a premium brand. But the biggest draw was for the first time Topps created a parallel card inserted into packs, their gold label parallel version for the 92 Topps set. And even more coveted than that, a bonus card that was included in the 1992 Topps gold version factory sets. It was an extra bonus card numbered 793 and it was a gold-plated and signed version of his 92 Topps card. This card was incredibly hard to come by, and collectors all wanted to get their hands on it, dreaming of what he could be when he caught up to the big leagues. His card shot up the hot list to the top of the charts, and collectors couldn't get enough of collecting Brian Taylor. But this video is all about prospect bus. So what happened? Well, Taylor was raw, and he had a lot to learn before he could actually make it to the big leagues. He did fare pretty well in his first year in single A, and even held his own in reaching double A as a 20 year old in 1993. But after the 1993 double A playoffs, 
Taylor got into a fight at a bar and threw a punch, which didn't land on anybody. But it resulted in a dislocated shoulder and torn labrum in his throwing arm. He missed the entire 1994 season, and even after that kicked around the minor leagues a little bit, but he was just never the same pitcher again. Brian Taylor never pitched above double-A ball and was out of the game by the age of 28. Like several other players coming on this list, Taylor had a lot of problems outside of baseball, as evidenced by his attempt to fight after the 1993 playoffs, which caused him his baseball career. In 2012, he was arrested and convicted of drug trafficking after selling narcotics to undercover agents over a period of several months. He was in prison for about three years and released in 2015. This is a classic case of what could have been had he not thrown that punch in 1993, and maybe his entire life would be a completely different story by this time. So that is a little walk down memory lane, 1990, 91, 92 season, and the huge prospect bust that occurred during that time. Join me next time where I'll cover more prospects in the following years. And in the meantime, be careful which prospects you invest in, keep talking baseball, and we'll see you around.